Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ken Kettenbuehl. I'm the Vice Chancellor for External Relations. Welcome to the Conversation with the Chancellor event. Uh, for those of you that are new, uh, we started this format back in well, was pre-pandemic. Pre uh, so 2018, 2019, when uh, Chancellor Grasso arrived on campus, it was a way to inform the campus on key things that were happening, as well as create a forum so there can be dialogue with him uh, and other senior leaders on, on various campus events. So this is the first time that we're first time we're doing this in person in a few years now because we've been virtual, as you all know. So it's great to see everyone. Uh, we did uh, one of the questions we got in advance is why wasn't this on the common day? And we tried. Uh, Michelle Barnes and David Disney and I were going back and forth. This would have been scheduled in February. We didn't want to wait that long. Uh, so we incentivized people with cider and donuts. So hopefully that was a good trade off. So uh, hopefully you're enjoying those. The uh, format of the, we changed the format up a little bit. Chancellor Grasso is going to give a little bit of a uh, presentation first on some key initiatives, and then we're going to uh, he'll join I'll join him up on stage, and uh, we'll have some dialogue just the two of us on topics that came in on the questions or things that we wanted to uh, communicate with the campus, and then we'll turn it over to you. So if you have questions at the end, and just hold questions to the end even after his presentation, we'll address those at the end of the presentation. So sound good? All right, uh, so with that, I will invite Chancellor Grasso to the podium to talk about a lot of great work that's been happening here uh, that's not COVID related. So, thank you. Thanks um, very much, Ken, and it's a, a pleasure to be here. And I have to say that the first uh, couple of times we did this, it was a little bit more uh, tense for me because I was still relatively new to the campus, but now I feel like I'm speaking to a group of friends. So I'd like this to be as casual as possible. And, and even though Ken said, hold your questions until the end, I'm going to change that just a little bit because if there's a slide up here and you have a question on it, uh, please go ahead and ask it while the slide is up here so we can address it. But it, it has been a long time since we've all gotten together here, and it's great to see so many people. And uh, if the donuts were why you came, please let us know that, because <laughs> I will have donuts at every meeting that uh, I want uh, high attendance at. Um, I would like to start, because it's been a long time, and because we've hired so many new people, I'd like everybody who has been hired recently, let's say since the beginning of the pandemic, right, to please stand. Everybody who's new. Wow. That's, that's terrific. I'd also like to uh, recognize <laughs> some of our new uh, director level individuals. Some have taken on additional responsibilities. Keisha uh, Blevins, who's my chief of staff, who is Keisha, is right here. Uh, stand up, Keisha, to be recognized. She's chief of staff, but now she's taken on the responsibility of chief diversity and inclusion officer, which is a, a major initiative that we have on this campus. And we'll talk a little bit about this uh, later on. Brian Earl, Brian is our permanent athletic director, no longer interim athletic director, and he's doing a terrific job. Steve Forrest, Forrester, is he here? He's not here. We'll give him a round of applause anyway. <laughs> Kristen Palm, I know she is here. She's in the back. She's new in our executive communications group. Um, Carrie Schumacher is right here. And in addition to being CIO, everybody's doing double duty here uh, because we are a multitasking organization. She is going to be chief strategy officer. And that doesn't mean that she's going to develop our strategies, but she's going to help us implement our strategy and track it and make sure that we uh, are meeting our milestones. Jean Song is our library director. Is she here? Nope. Let's give her a round of applause. Katie Stone, uh, our new uh, EC, EC director? Uh, no. And Brad Wolver, who may be short-lived. And I say that because not because he's not doing a good job. Uh, is he here? It's because uh, Ann Arbor is trying to steal him from us. So uh, he's doing such a good job that we may lose him to Ann Arbor. Nonetheless, let's give him a round of applause. Okay, so I'd like to go through some of the exciting things that are happening on campus here. 
And the first that many of you are going to be uh, interested in, I think, is where we stand on enrollment. And this is where we stand on enrollment. We have about a 20% increase in master's students, which is pretty significant since last year. We have the largest incoming class of international students. Our transfers have increased by almost 7%, 6.6%. And this is important because we have see, had seen a monotonic steady decline of transfer students for, for the last several years. How many years has it been declining, Melissa? Uh, since 17. So I didn't, I should have looked at that. Since 17, it says it up there. Uh, since 17, we've been seeing it. So this is the first time we started to see a change in that. Sadly, though, our FIDIAC students, which is our first time students uh, that are entering as uh, first years, has declined by 7.3%. Uh, there could be a lot of reasons for this. Uh, of course, demographics is starting to play a role in this because our student, uh, uh, high school student population is decreasing and we're getting increased competition from all of the schools around us. But we're working on turning uh, that around. Our, and this is very important. Our four-year graduation rate has increased by 3% to 33%. This is very important because this is what we're here about. It's not just about bringing in students, but making sure they get across the finish line. And that is a, a very strong movement in this direction. <clears throat> That's a result of a number of different things we did, go into block tuition, improving our advising. There are so many things that we have been working on to increase our graduation rates and it's starting to pay off. Our two, uh, <clears throat> total new students are up 1.2% and our overall enrollment decreased by 1%. So this may be uh, somewhat conflicting, but we think that it's decreased because we have more students graduating. So we're, we're not holding on to them as long, so they're graduating, and our total student population is going down a little bit. And really importantly, because of our changes in financial aid strategy, so we're shifting our financial aid strategy to need first, as opposed to merit first. You still have to be meritorious to get financial aid, but we're looking at need first. We were able to increase our net tuition revenue by 9%, even though our student uh, population only uh, increased by 1.2%. So this is all positive, uh, except for the FIDIAC. Everything else is uh, positive uh, directions that we're moving in, and we should all be proud, and it's all a, a result of all of your hard work both in, on the staff side and on the faculty side. And of course, on the student side because they have to graduate. Uh, okay, academic affairs. So um, this is under the provost's office and they're doing a lot of terrific things. Uh, our provost has only been on board for uh, a few months in, in a permanent capacity, but she's been here for a year and we've been working uh, towards uh, converting our classes from three, cl three credits to four credits. This is an, a, an initiative that's going to help our faculty teach fewer courses during the year, but at the same time uh, s devote more time to their scholarly pursuits. And at the same time, students would take fewer courses during the semester so they could focus on fewer courses, and that way they could hopefully graduate more, uh, more efficiently in, in their pursuit. So that's an important initiative that we're working on. We're also looking at uh, our practice-based learning initiatives and we're working with WPI uh, and we, we're doing a lot of collaboration going back and forth. Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts that's a leader in this type of, of initiative and they've got a center there and we're working with them. Um, we are bringing in thought leaders to help share their big ideas on different topics that relate to us. Uh, next month in November, we have uh, Clayton Spencer, who's president of Bates College, and they are a small elite liberal arts school, and they are working on something called purposeful work as a way to contextualize the liberal arts. And that is so much close, so closely related to our work in practice-based education that I invited her here to talk about their work around purposeful work, and I think that that's going to be exciting. She also has a, uh, an outstanding faculty member 
who's been very successful in STEM equity, April Hill. So she is going to accompany uh, Clayton, and we're going to have a, a, another conversation around STEM equity, and they're going to share their successes on how they've been able to make sure that underrepresented groups are successful in the STEM courses. A lot of STEM courses are difficult, whether you're underrepresented or or in the majority of representation, but nonetheless, they've got ideas on how to deal with STEM equity that we'd like to hear. We also have Desmond Patton from Penn, who's going to be speaking on uh, diversity issues, and he's done a lot of uh, great work in that area as well. Um, we are going to have our first round table uh, on mental health that's planned for later this semester, and we're launching two Dean's searches uh, to replace two outstanding deans that are terming out because they've been here for two five-year terms and that's the uh, university standard policy is 10 years and uh, administrators are, are, um, are typically rotated out so we could bring in different uh, individuals with different ideas. So we're, we're engaging Isaacson and Miller, the search firm, and we're going to start, uh, we're looking for new dean start dates of next summer. And hopefully we'll be launching those searches very, very soon. Okay, uh, research. This is another s tremendous success story. Our external research funding has increased to $11 million. Uh, and Armin Zakarian, where is Armin? Who is our, uh, there he is, uh, is our, <laughs> give him a hand because he's been leading this effort, has been uh, a tremendous leader in, in making this a reality here. When, we, when I arrived here, our external research funding was about $4.7 million, so we've more than doubled that, and uh, the majority of that increase is now from federal sources, which is, again, an exciting, uh, an exciting uh, note for our campus because those are competitive and typically highly competitive resources to get. And <clears throat> we've also uh, been awarded <clears throat> $400,000 awarded internally to support faculty research. So that's a, another, which is significantly more than uh, we've awarded in the past. And that is uh, a, a, another indication that we're really asking our faculty to use their, their talents to the betterment of, of society and humanity. So we're supporting their initial ideas and hopefully they can translate that and leverage it into uh, external uh, funding. And two of our faculty members received NSF Career Awards, which for a campus our size is very impressive. And the NSF Career Awards are young uh, investigator awards that are very competitive to get. And, uh, and to have two of them on our campus in one year is really an accomplishment. Um, <clears throat> our business office has been uh, very busy working on a new model for our campus, Responsibly Centered Management. So we're launching this model, or we have launched this model, and it's being uh, led by Brian Dady, our Vice Chancellor for, uh, for Business Affairs. And this model, for those of you who are unfamiliar with RCM, moves the responsibility to the units. So the deans are now going to be essentially the CEOs. They have been the CEOs, but now they're going to have more financial um, management and control over their systems of their own units. So they're going to be responsible for revenue generation, but they're also going to be responsible for expenses. And they are going to have much more control over their destiny with this new model here. And this is a, a difficult transition, but Brian and the deans have worked closely on this, and I think it's, it's going very uh, smoothly. <clears throat> We've also created a new budget review process for service units. Because the deans are now going to hold the majority of the money, it's, they are going to essentially be paying to run the library or to run facilities or to run other uh, external to, to their colleges service units. So we're reviewing those expenses so the deans can see why it's costing so much in these different units and can, be, can have a role in determining what their, quote, tax from these units is going to be. <clears throat> and all, through all of this, we've also increased 
our university reserves from $17 million to $38 million, which is still less than where we should be for a university our size and our budget, but it, we're on the right track. So we have never had this level of reserves in the past, and now because of uh, judicious financial management, we're starting to build reserves. So if we do encounter downturns, we won't be uh, as negatively effective as we could have been or been prone to. And our endowment has grown by over 50% uh, to $86 million, and we probably lost all of that in the last couple of weeks. But this is, uh, it was $86 million at, at when we were first doing this presentation. Uh, on DEI, this is also uh, very uh, important. So our university center is going to be renamed on uh, November, what day? 17th. On November 17th, we're going to officially have a ceremony to name it the James Rennick University Center. James Rennick was uh, a previous chancellor, and he did a lot of terrific things here. It's also a, a, an indication of our commitment to, to diversity on campus. He was an African-American man, and uh, it is clear, and it's uh, an indication that our first named building we don't have any named honorific buildings. We have buildings named after donors, but we don't have any honorific buildings on this campus. It is uh, going to be after James Rennick. So there'll be a ceremony there. We're also commissioning a, an oil painting of him that will hang in the uh, center as well. Um, we appointed our first uh, two uh, Inclusive Excellence Fellows that uh, we'll, we're working with Keisha on this. And uh, are either Terry Laws or Hafiz Malik here? No, they're not. But they are in different fields. Uh, Terry is in African, uh, African American studies, and Hafiz is in electrical engineering. So we've got two people that are going to be working from very different disciplinary backgrounds, looking at how we can collaborate better between the administration and the faculty around DE issues and they've got several projects that they're going to be working on there. We did a climate survey that uh, we're going to be reporting out. We did a climate, climate survey uh, uh, la this year. It was this year, Pam? Yeah, it was this year and uh, I think it was planned for... Go ahead. Last winter semester. Last winter semester. Okay, last winter semester. And uh, we, we're still doing some analysis but we'll be sharing the results of that climate survey with the whole campus. <laughs> Uh, as soon as we complete the, the final set of surveys. And we're doing a, a staff satisfaction surveys that's going to be uh, launched in 2023. And I mentioned earlier that April Hill is going to be speaking on STEM equity from uh, Bates College. And uh, uh, yesterday, for those of you who are fortunate enough to join us, we didn't have donuts. And that was a mistake on my part, but next time we will have donuts. Scott Page was here, and Scott is a distinguished university professor at the uh, Uni University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and he did a terrific presentation on what he calls a diversity bonus. And he provided a quantitative mathematical reasoning for why diversity is important to the success of organizations. And it was a, a great talk. I had invited Scott when I was provost at the University of Delaware to, uh, to come to Delaware and deliver the same talk, essentially. He filled an auditorium there. And I don't, we must have had donuts there. But uh, I think that next time we'll do that. And as I mentioned, Desmond Patton from Penn will be coming uh, very soon as well. <clears throat> On the development side, we've raised over $16.5 million uh, towards our campaign. Is Cassandra here? We don't have Cassandra, but uh, her team is doing a terrific job there. Uh, our Giving Blue Day was the most successful to date, raising over $130,000. And we've increased the number of our donors by over 35%. And we've secured uh, significant amounts of money for different uh, facilities on campus, uh, the Mitchell Communication Lab and uh, COB, and the Accelerate Blue Fund, which is an entrepreneurial fund in, uh, for the university as a whole for uh, start, early startups, uh, have also 
been uh, donated to us. So this is uh, very good, but I do want to say that we've, we've done two campaigns, and I know I'm not supposed to say this, I'm glad Cassandra's not here because she'd have a heart attack, but we've done two campaigns and they were, it is being recorded. <laughs> but we're going to edit this out for <laughs> when Cassandra accesses it. It'll be bleeped out. We've done two campaigns, and they were both around $50 million. And I am shooting for a much higher number in this campaign. We've increased the number of, of our donors. We've uncovered the fact that we have four, four billionaires that are U of M Dearborn graduates. So we have i think individuals out there that have significant giving capacity we're going to be asking everyone to uh to be generous to support this great institution because our mission is really an exciting mission mission and i, I do want to say that we i think are the most unique institution in america and the reason i say that is because on the one hand we are a regional campus we have, we have accessibility for all the students. We fight it out with all the other regional campuses in our area for students. We fight it out with uh, Wayne State and with Oakland and with EMU. And we're trying to make a case why these students should come here. On the same, at the same time, we are part of the greatest university in the world. There is no other university that I can think of that you could say you have access to this campus. We are a regional university of opportunity and you are part of the greatest university in the world. You have access to the libraries in Ann Arbor. You have access to the museums in Ann Arbor. You can go to the athletic events, you can go to the concerts, you can go to lectures in Ann Arbor. You could do all of that on our campus as well. This is a very special place. And I'm going to be telling all of our donors this as uh, this campaign uh, unfolds. But we're going to be shooting for a campaign goal that's significantly higher than $50 million in the future. And I know Cassandra will probably have a heart attack, but uh, that's where we're going. External relations. Um, Ken has been uh, doing a terrific job in external relations. We've had a brand refresh. We're going to be uh, updating our uh, messaging for the campaign starting in January 2023. We, and we're going to uh, refresh our undergraduate and graduate advertising campaigns by January 23. So that's all uh, coming up. And uh, we're, we're really working hard to have a, a new brand image with new advertising that's going to be launched very, very soon. And we're, we've upgraded our content management system to make it easier to navigate. Our, uh, our websites. So all that's happened in external relations. In athletics, uh, one of the things that I'm very proud of is that we're successful on the playing fields, on the, play, on the gym floors, but we're also successful in the classroom. 65 of our juniors and seniors, or 44% of all of our junior senior athletes, had a GPA of 3.5 or higher. That's very impressive. Our volleyball uh, student athlete, Brooke uh, Weatherill, is, I can't read, is that right? right. Uh, uh, currently leads the nation in blocks per set. And our cross country, men's and uh, women's cross, men's cross country team uh, and women's cross country team has finished in the top two of their uh, recent meets that typically hosts between eight and 10 teams. So we're doing well on the athletic fields and we're doing uh, well in the classroom. And because our gym floor, if anybody's gonna ask, is taking too long to complete, and it's, I have to say, I am as frustrated as Brian is and as the athletes are, and Brian has heard me on the telephone raising my voice about why we're not getting this done, uh, it's not going to be completed now until, I think, February. Is that correct? So uh, Brian, because of his ingenuity, has arranged for our basketball team, men and women's basketball team, to play games in Chrysler Arena, which I think is really an exciting opportunity for them to play in that big venue. And Brian, I, I asked Brian a while ago to start setting up some rivalries with other Big Ten regional campuses. So Brian has set up our first one with the Penn State 
regional campus, our second one, because we went there last year and they're coming here and they're gonna play in Chrysler. So it'll be exciting for them as well uh, on December 20th. So I hope you can all make that. Now I'd like to just quickly talk about our Go Blueprint for Success, which is our strategic plan, which Carrie's gonna make sure that we fulfill. And uh, one of the first things that we did uh, after we finalized it, and we had a lot of meetings to finalize it, as you recall, we had uh, uh, town hall meetings and focus sessions and specific uh, committee meetings. We devised, uh, can we have the next slide, please? We put together key performance indicators. And key performance indicators are metrics. They're metrics that have times associated with them, and they're quantitative. And as the quotes uh, say there from P P Peter Drucker, uh, what gets measured gets done, right? So if we're not measuring things, we could say we're gonna do all these things, then nothing really happens. So we're, we wanna make sure that we've identified key metrics and then put numbers associated with that. But I wanna be clear because everything that can be counted doesn't necessarily count and everything that counts doesn't always get counted. So we're going to have to adjust this as we move on. And there are gonna be things that fall outside the bounds of quantitative measure, like culture is going to be a difficult thing to, to get a handle on, but we're gonna be trying to work on that. So some examples are, for example, student success. We wanna increase our FIDIAC four-year four graduation rate over the next 10 years from 32% to 41%. That would be, that's a kind of a reach goal, but that's where we wanna go. Um, we want to increase uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We wanna make sure that our senior leaders go have uh, experienced courses or activities and workshops that deal with diversity. We wanna make sure 100% of them have had that in the next 10 years. Right now, 54% have had that. So these are uh, some of the measures that we're looking at. Economic sustainability, we wanna increase our reserves 2% annually. So we've increased it from 17 to 38 million, which is significant. We wanna keep that going on track. And finally, uh, faculty and staff excellence. We wanna uh, take Armin's terrific success and keep it going and double it again in the next 10 years. So we wanna go from 11 million to 22 million. When I came here, uh, just one second, uh, Kristen, when I came here and I looked at the quality of the faculty on this campus and I just looked at who they were, what their pedigrees were, what their areas of expertise was, in my mind, I thought that a school of this caliber should be doing somewhere between 30 and $60 million a year in external funding. And I, I base that on my experience at a lot of different schools. So that is my long-term trajectory is to get us up to 30 to $60 million. But in the meantime, we're gonna get to $22 million in the, uh, in the next 10 years. Thank you. And uh, so we're taking those KPIs and we're vetting them. This is, uh, we're gonna have another session strictly devoted to KPIs. So you're all gonna be welcome. We'll have more donuts. And, uh, and you can comment on the KPIs. But we've already gone to our National Advisory Board. These are our most distinguished alums that comprise uh, an advisory group to me. We've, we're taking it to our Citizens uh, Advisory Committee that's coming up in the next week or two. We're gonna take it to the Faculty and Staff Senates next week uh, and student government. Then we're gonna have a campus-wide forum and have everybody that didn't have an opportunity to come and, and talk again about them. And what we want to know is, do we have the right metrics and do we have the right numbers associated with the metrics? And we have, what we're gonna show you is where we are today, where we wanna be in 10 years. But in the meantime, once we've identified that, then we will have annual uh, waypoints that we want to, to uh, achieve to get to the 10 year mark. And then we will take it to the uh, board of Regents and the, pre the President and the Board of Regents. And in the meantime, I'm meeting with each of the Regents um, 
I've already met with one. I've got uh, a lunch set up with three more in the next couple of weeks, and I just show them quickly what our KPIs are to show them that we're taking this quantitative approach, and I pull it back because it's not finalized yet, but they, th at least one of them has been very impressed, uh, and he happened to be the chair of the board, happened to be very impressed with our approach to this. So I think that they are going to be very happy once we, we have gone through this and we've identified what the KPIs are and everybody's had a chance to touch them and we've accommodated everybody's input. So uh, that's, uh, okay, oh, almost. <laughs> Our strategic uh, enrollment management plan, which is uh, Melissa Stone. Melissa, do you want to stand up? Melissa is our... Uh, our uh, director for enrollment management, and she's going to be putting together a strategic enrollment management plan that comes out of our strategic plan, and it is going to help us identify how to attract and retain students and then help them graduate. So it's an, a specifically that's going to be based on enrollment management. But I want to be very clear that even though she bears the title of director of enrollment management, enrollment management, like... DEI is all of our responsibility. So everybody has to play a role in how we attract and retain and graduate our students, just like we all have to play a role in the uh, DEI culture on this campus. So with that, I think that was that. That was the, sorry that I forgot that slide. Okay. Oh, wait, did anybody have any questions on any of the slides before Ken starts asking me questions? No? See, they are going to wait to the end like I instructed them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chancellor Grasso. Uh, a lot of good work. And um, as we know, and, and a lot of people in this room, you know, as you mentioned, and not in this room, had a lot to do with... Uh, a lot of great accomplishments, so thank you for sharing that. So there's a handful of questions I'll go over with you and then we'll turn it over in about 15 minutes to the audience. But um, you know, th this, this semester seems like the first normal one in quite some time. And I know it's still not totally normal. I know, for example, my department, we're being asked to do things we haven't done in two or three years, so we're forgetting what we did back in 2019. So you know, we're shaking out some cobwebs. But what, do, what are your observations and your impressions on how the semester started this fall? Uh, I think it has started very well. And I am excited when I talk to people. And everybody has a very positive outlook. I think I'll, everybody likes being back on campus. And we're excited to work together. This is a family. Just like when I started, I said, I feel like I'm talking to friends. I think it's like getting all your friends together at the end of summer vacation. Everybody went away. Now we're back at school. And it's fun again. So, and there's um, sort of the building back culture and community, you know, was something that was important to you as we were preparing for the fall semester. So there were some big events that, we, that happened, you know, at the start of the semester. So can you talk a little bit about why we did them and what your goals and objectives were, particularly with the bike ride? We all know you're an avid biker um, and see you on campus, you know, biking. But talk a little bit about your, your thoughts on um, why those are important for people to engage in. Well, I think that everybody... We know that everybody works very hard on this campus in, in all of your jobs, whether you're a staff member, a faculty member. So I wanted to have opportunities for us to interact outside of what we need to do for our jobs and find ways that we can enjoy each other and in, enjoy each other's company. And we had our first kickball game, which I was so disappointed because I was looking so forward to it. And then they came down with COVID and I missed it. But uh, I will make the next kickball game. We had the town gown uh, bike ride and walk. And I hope that some of you will join us next time because we'll do it again next year. And if you don't, if you're not comfortable on a bike, we can uh, do a walk. And, and Caitlin, our bike officer back there, helped lead it. We had so many police officers. I do not think that Pre President <laughs> Biden has that much security when he's traveling. They were blocking off roads. Everybody was super secure there. They did a great job. And uh, we did the uh, Chancellor's Book Club, which I have to say I really enjoyed. We had some terrific conversation. Uh, Gabriella, Maureen, there were so many terrific uh, uh, Amy, uh, 
folks that were part of the uh, Melissa, I, uh, Brian, I could, uh, Carrie, I, I could go through everybody who was there. It was a lot of fun. And it was, we started a, a very casual conversation about very important topics. And that was a lot of fun. And so I hope that we could continue enjoying ourselves uh, both inside our job constraints and outside as, as in a social environment as well. Well, just a tip for the kickball game next year, make sure you get on the IT team because they hold <laughs> disrupting our internet access over our, all the other teams. So just little tip, inside tip for you there. Um, common days. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier today, we tried to do this event on a common day. There's a lot of activity that's resumed on campus. So it's hard to get everything on a Monday or, or a, uh, a Thursday. But talk a little bit about common days, the the philosophy behind it and expectations on days that maybe aren't common days that for the campus. Okay, so um, this is kind of a sensitive topic, but I, I want to be as blunt as I can be about it, right? So before COVID, there was no expectation that people were going to be working from home. COVID happened and we had to pivot quickly and we did a terrific job pivoting continuing to do our work and not missing a beat. So when we came back, right, after COVID, there is no reason to continue to work remotely. And a lot of companies don't allow people to work remotely, especially the finance companies, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. Nonetheless, we saw this as an opportunity to accommodate different lifestyles and make it as comfortable as possible to work. So we, are coming up with this view of a, a hybrid where people can work from home on certain days and they can come in on certain days. And we chose certain days that we would like to expect people to be here so that we can interact. But I want to make, be clear that this is not an entitlement. This is something that we're trying to do as a benefit to everybody so that you can enjoy your lives as fully as possible and we can still do an outstanding job of running the university. So we are still fine-tuning this model, so to speak. We have a, a workforce committee that is working on this, but it is something that we're doing hopefully as a benefit to you and that you, you can take advantage of. But at the same time, we don't want you to think that anything work-wise is going to be compromised for personal benefit, right? So we want to make sure that nothing gets dropped at work, but at the same time, if we could do it well or better at home, that uh, we're, we're going to try to accommodate that. And I should add that the Future Work Task Force is working on those recommendations or some focus groups that are scheduled in November. And, um, you know, this is all new and we learned a lot, you know, from the last couple of years. So. It's a lot of good work that's going into figuring the future out. Um, you know, my wife works for General Motors, and they had they had to pull back an announcement that they were going back, and we're not the only ones maybe struggling with this. You know, no. for sure. So um, I don't want to talk a lot about COVID, but I, I do. We're getting into the flu and uh, <laughs> the flu season, and, and illnesses start. And you know, we we have people here, Maddie Drury and Molly McCutcheon, are still tracking cases across campus. Uh, they're very minimal. Uh, they will alert leadership, you know, when there's something to be concerned about. But are you having any conversations at the EO table in Ann Arbor? It, it seems like the worst is definitely behind us. And um, but you know, are there conversations at all in Ann Arbor about where we are with the pandemic? Um, I, you know, I'm just trying to uh, rotate back through all the EOs. I don't think we've talked about COVID in recent right. times. But I have to say, I think about COVID all the time. And I check every morning to see where Washtenaw and Wayne County and Oakland Macomb counties are on the CDC uh, health advisory website. And we're a medium. Everybody around us is medium. So that, that looks at hospital beds. It looks at positive, positive cases. It looks at vaccination. It looks at everything there. So we're in the medium range right now. Uh, if we started to track to the high range and it's sustained and we have issues with beds, uh, hospital beds, then we may start to look at, at alternative uh, approaches to how we, we're transacting our work. But it is something that is constantly on my mind 
and I'm sure it's on, on, I know it's on Rob Ernst's mind, who's our chief health officer, but we have not had EO conversations uh, about this. So I, I did look this morning, and we're all medium, and, uh, and we've been medium for quite a long time. Yeah, I think I read last week the, there wasn't one county in Michigan that was red for the first time in a long time, maybe ever. So that's great news. Um, and I know we have flu shots that are going to be offered on campus in November. I believe there's information that was in Reporter. So while maybe we're not talking about COVID, there's other illnesses and there's uh, services that will be available. So just a reminder on that. Um, uh, let me just say yeah. that in addition to the flu shot, uh, at the same clinics, we're going to be offering the COVID uh, bivalent booster. So if you had your flu shot and you want the bivalent booster, you could come just for that or uh, vice versa, or you could get both. And we're offering it at a significant discount. It's free. It's free, yes. <laughs> With a donut, maybe. With a <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if that'll get people there, we'll do no donuts. No donuts, Rima said. <laughs> All right. Not I'm healthy. <laughs> Um, Domenico, you have a new boss that started last Friday, and boy, does he like to tweet. I, 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 I had to turn my ringer off yesterday. He was firing like three or four off around the 8.30, 9 o'clock hour, and I was watching TV, and he was bothering me. But um, So um, have you met with him, um, your impressions with him as he talked about Dearborn? And I understand he's coming here uh, later this semester. My first face-to-face, uh, one-on-one -one with him is on November 8th. but. I've, I've uh, had a Zoom meeting with him. I've had brief meetings with him, and he um, uh, sat next to me at the EO meeting yesterday, which caught me by surprise. Uh, so, I, and I, we had a small conversation there. But he is full of energy, as you've indicated. Oh, I know. He's got some <laughs> terrific ideas, but most importantly, he seems very interested in a tighter working relationship with the regional campuses. Um, early on in my first meeting with him, and then uh, Deba did the same, uh, the chancellor from Flint did the same thing in his first meeting, we suggested that we have uh, CEO meetings, so to speak, the CEO of the Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn campuses, separate from EOs, that we would just meet together because we each run the campuses. And he was very receptive to that, to the point where he said uh, yesterday that he's going to set up these, quote, system-type meetings uh, very soon. So that's going to be, a, I think, a big, um, a big plus for us because we'll be able to talk about things that are, are very important to us. And he's coming to campus, I think, what, December 9th? 9th. It's a Friday. It's December 9th. He's going to come to campus. He's going to have one of these open forums. Uh, and I'm going to do a test. I'm not going to have donuts. I'm going to see how, <laughs> how, uh, how interested you all are in listening to the president. I'm just kidding. We'll probably have donuts. <laughs> we'll get as many people here as possible. I know. Yeah, you can get right. He'll yeah, yep. Awesome. And he, you probably know he was throwing T-shirts to the yeah. students at the game. At the game. He is. Uh, he definitely is a very social. Um, uh, socially constructed individual. Yes. Um, you, you talked a little bit about, you mentioned Flint, Daba. You know, there's, they've been in the news lately. If anyone watched the last Regents meeting, President Coleman, right out of the gate, talked about the difficulties they're having, uh, the task force that's been implemented. She was up there for a town hall meeting. Do you want to talk a little bit about our sister campus up, up the road? Well, Flint, uh, again, is another terrific institution with a lot of potential. It, it, it has the same essential characteristics as we do. It's a regional campus that offers a Michigan degree, and I'm sure they have outstanding alums, although I don't. And if anybody has, uh, has had the opportunity or had, has not yet, uh, there's an uh, editorial in the Michigan Alumni Magazine that I wrote about the importance of uh, valuing our graduates as well as the Ann Arbor graduates. So I would ask you to take a look at that. It's on the second page of the alumni magazine. But, and I'm sure that Flint has similar successful alums, but they have fallen on hard times and by no fault of their own. They had the Flint water crisis, GM pulled out, there's a high crime up in that area. The, the housing stock has been really depressed there and the downtown area is kind of a ghost town so it is it and this has nothing to do with the institution 
So the institution, however, has, has had the resulting uh, consequences of this uh, situation up there and has seen a significant drop in student enrollment. Over the last five or 10 years, they have had a steady decrease in student enrollment. And because they're, they, similar to us, are tuition driven, their resources have decreased significantly and they've been facing layoffs and they have classes that have less than five people in that, five students in them. So they are looking for ways to turn this around. They, as you probably know, they've hired your own consulting firm, which was started as a spinoff of Arthur Anderson. They've got a lot of experience in higher education. They are, uh, have attracted the attention of the folks in Ann Arbor at, at various levels. The, we're having a regents meeting there tomorrow. But everybody is in this to help Flint succeed. And there are going to be hard decisions that Flint has to make to become successful. We're, and I've offered this to the chancellor there, we're here standing ready to help them any way we can, but we are in a very different situation in Flint. And when I hear conversations that include us in the same context as Flint, I flinch a little bit. And that is because we are not in any way similar to Flint. And I, I want to make sure that uh, you all understand that and you do not consider us in any kind of danger. Our reserves are going up, our net tuition revenue is going up, our research is going up, our uh, notoriety is going up. Everything is in a positive direction on this campus. So when you hear people say Flint and Dearborn, you have to wait for the next clause in that sentence because uh, it could be misleading. And I just want to uh, say that very clearly. And I'd be happy to talk more about this if anybody has any specific questions. Awesome. Um, and then just final question, Domenico, anything you want to share what's coming up? I know we have an announcement on Monday with our neighbors next door at HFC. Uh, you wanted to preview the state of the university next semester uh, before we open it up to questions for the audience. So uh, next uh, winter, January, February, February or February timeframe, we're going to have another State of the University address in the ELB like we did last year, and we're going to have another winter carnival. Hopefully, that'll be even more fun than it was last year. Again, going down this path of social engagement with everybody. Maybe we'll have a snowball fight. I don't know if there's snow out there. Or maybe make snowmen. I guess snowball fight's pretty belligerent. But uh, <laughs> uh, maybe making snowmen or something. I'm on the IT team. And, um, and uh, th so that's uh, upcoming. Oh, and we put uh, Adirondack chairs around, and I'm hoping to get more Adirondack chairs so people can start enjoying the campus. It's a beautiful campus. One of the other things that we've done is uh, I invited to Tony Kolenek here, who's the director of the Nichols Arboretum, to work with our EIC folks to think about what opportunities that we could better capitalize on around EIC. And I think he's got some great ideas and we're gonna to try to make that an even more inviting place for, for not just our community, but the, the greater Dearborn community as well. So these are the types of things that are happening. And, and as Ken said, we've got an announcement about a close collaboration with Henry Ford uh, on Monday. And, uh, and hopefully that'll get some good press. And we got WJR coming. Um, to campus, right? We're doing a, uh, a college road show where one of five campuses are going to uh, visit on Thursday. So it's going to be live from the University Center and we're able to, and full disclosure, it's a marketing opportunity. We paid for it, but we're able to, um, <laughs> we're, we're, we got a lot of TV spots, but there's a, a lot of airtime that we're getting for our faculty, uh, our, st our students, and for uh, the chancellor, as well as one of our industry partners that is going to be with him talking about how our students are prepared for careers and problem practice-based learning and, and those types of things. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a marketing play. <laughs> so, all right. Um, well, that, that, those are my questions. We have about eight minutes or so. I thought we'd have a little bit more time, but Kristen and Bailey have mics. If you have a question, just raise your hand. There was one question that was submitted in advance, so I'm gonna start with that one first. I'm gonna put Gabriella 
and Amy on the spot. Uh, the question was, um, what are we hearing from students You know, with the start of the semester? A lot of them are still in doing hybrid courses. Things have been reimagined. Has campus life come back? Uh, Gabriel and Amy, do you want to mention something real quick? So I think there are some really good indicators on the health of student life. So I'll give a quick example. Um, our Victor's Link software is where our student orgs go to submit their events. Um, and I was just sharing with Gabriella just last week that between now and the end of the term, we have 286 events that are sitting on Victor's Link um, that are primarily student org driven. Some are department driven. I would say 80 to 85 percent of those are in-person events. Our students are really enjoying being back and having the ability to be in community community in person, and we're seeing that play out in, in many ways, right? So you may notice if you're coming to the University Center around lunchtime, it's a lot more robust than it was last year. I would say it's not have to stalk for a table like it was in 19, but I would say you do have to kind of look for a table because it's, it's lively, right? Um, another example that I would provide is just the Campus Involvement Hub here down at the end, which has been recently renovated. For those who aren't aware, um, that space now is the home to student organizations, but also an opportunity for students to come and meet with an involvement consultant to get a curated list of what are the types of things that they might like to get involved with that meet their needs. And we're seeing a lot of traffic there. We're seeing also a lot of traffic for people borrowing our branded lawn games to go outside and play to sit in the Adirondack chairs that the Chancellor referenced. And we're seeing great turnout at our big events. So if you had an opportunity to participate in any of our homecoming events, we had just over 200 at our homecoming dance on Thursday night. We had almost 200 at our tailgate on Friday night. We had a robust turnout at our um, cardboard boat races, which is a great tra campus tradition. So we're seeing a lot on the student life side that I think points really positively to the health of our student life. But while I say that, I just want to remind everybody that this is still a really difficult time for many students as they figure out how comfortable they are being in community, um, renegotiating what it means to be a college student, particularly if this is the first time they're a college student in person. And that can be really difficult. And so I would just invite and encourage you to remember that our CAPS team um, is ready to help with students who might be having a difficult time. Um, last year, 418 students came in with zero wait time. So that's really important. There isn't a long wait. I know sometimes there are stories about, oh, wait times. We have no wait times in CAP. So if a student is having a difficult time, please encourage them to stop by our CAPS office, let us know so we can help. Thank you. Join Amy. Uh, Amy. Amy Gabriel is going to, from the academic side. Yes. Just a couple of things, as I think Amy said, our students are back, and I just wanted to go back to two points that the chancellors made the common days. We're working out these models. Uh, um, the reason we have this talk today is that there is so much going on on Mondays and Thursdays, is that we can't fit everything in in those two days. So, uh, you know, that's just a reality, which is a good thing. And second, going back to the enrollments, you've seen how many uh, international students we have, right? And I know some of you have heard that before. If they are here, our campus is all they have. They don't have another community. They don't have their family to go back to. They don't have their friends to go back to. They only have us. So that's why we need to show up and be here for them. We, we need to have a vibrant campus, still maintaining the hybrid model, but to be here for them, and I think that's very important. And all, I know a lot of you have made that a priority, and I really want to thank you for that. I know our staff and faculty both have been extremely good, but uh, that's one of the reasons why this campus is the way it is, fantastic. Is thanks to you, we need to be here for our students. I hope we answered that question. Ken? It was online, so I'm sure we did. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Tani Prokopo, Director of Health Professions Advising. I noticed um, on your KPIs that you had a lot of things for faculty, and I think that's wonderful. But as a member of the staff, I want to advocate for a KPI for the staff. Um, one of the things that I was thinking of is that staff do research and staff do publish. And if there's a KPI that can be something for the achievements of staff, I think that would be very motivating. and. Um, um, a way to advocate for staff. Thank you. I, that's a great suggestion, and uh, we certainly would rely on the, the scholarly productivity of our staff as well as our faculty, and I think that's a great suggestion. Any other 
questions. Okay. Okay. Well, there are more donuts and uh, <laughs> so lots of help cider. You so, and a lot of cider. <laughs> so uh, have a, a great rest of the semester. I hope to see you in Adirondack chairs or enjoying the, our beautiful campus. And if you have any questions or comments, please uh, send them to me personally and call me, email me, text me, however you'd like to, and I'll try to get to you as soon as I can. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You.